so Marcio talked about fish, uh, on coral, in fact all these people are coral. Um, Kylie Cook is here, she pretty much did all the hard work on this along with Millie who also made a, played a big role, Barty Joey Rangers played a very big role and um, as did these, these other people so it was very much team effort like most Kimberley uh, work. Um, this project uh, is obviously part of Marcia, the one that Marcel leads, um, but it fits in quite nicely with a few other WAMSI projects. Uh, it fits in nicely with the ecological connectivity study, largely the genetic study, uh, that Jim Underwood did the coral component and Ollie took over. Uh, also, I, we did a review of uh, coral reproduction in Western Australia for the dredging uh, node, and uh, that certainly told us uh, about what kind of information was lacking for the, for the inshore Kimberley region. Uh, in particular, for the offshore oceanic reefs of the Kimberley, we have a reasonable knowledge of coral reproduction and recruitment. Uh, it's clear, however, on the inshore uh, Kimberley region is far less known. There's only a couple of samples that have been taken, and um, really they're, they're a little bit biased in that sense. So we, uh, we focused our uh, study in the, the southern Kimberley region. We wanted to overlap as much as possible with other work that's been done throughout these other uh, WAMSI projects, so at least these data could be as complementary as possible. Uh, so there are a lot of coral, coral reefs uh, throughout the Kimberley, which many of you probably know. It's clear that uh, one of the, one of the, um, one of the uh, conclusions from all these, these work is that the, the entire Kimberley region is very patchy over a huge range of scales. Uh, there's extensive coral reefs throughout them, but they, they vary quite considerably. Even on the smallest scale, you can find uh, variation in community composition. And it's, as Marcel suggested, there's this kind of mosaic of habitats. There's not, not really this kind of clear zonation or clear habitat differentiation that you find in other places that we might work. Uh, and Barry Wilson's got a great book um, talking about all manner of uh, aspects of the Kimberley. Uh, sexual reproduction is important for corals, uh, spawning, um, planulation and recruitment because that's really how their populations are maintained. Uh, there's some asexual uh, maintenance but really it's uh, a sexual process. Uh, there's very few data for the intro Kimberley and that, that became apparent through, uh, when we went through their, um, the published and also great literature for uh, Western Australia on coral reproduction. So one of the key, uh, one of the key questions we are interested in is whether whether or not the times of spawning and reproduction were similar to the offshore reefs of the Kimberley or whether they are in fact uh, more similar to say the Pilbara regions or further south and what's the relative contribution to population maintenance community structure of the spawning versus the brooding corals. <coughs> um, when you look at the offshore the oceanic Kimberley reefs they tend to grow, group out in community assemblage much closer to say Indonesian uh, reefs than they do the than they do to the inshore region. So then we, we, this is one of those interesting questions about whether uh, inshore Kimberley groups more with Pilbara than say offshore, for example. Uh, video of coral spawning. Um, so there are two, for those who don't know, there are two, two um, main types of reproductive mode in corals. Uh, there's the spawners. Uh, they spawn gametes and, la um, and sperm. Uh, they produce larvae that float around in the water column for a couple of days to a couple of weeks. And that has real implications, obviously, for uh, how far the larvae disperse and therefore the maintenance recovery of populations. Uh, the brooding corals are the ones in which the sperm are released, fertilization happens within the coral polyp, and the larva develops <coughs> internally. And what that means is the larva generally, it will take are ready to settle not long after they're released from the polyp. So they tend to uh, not disperse as far. And there's, fairly, there's a lot of evidence for that in terms of scales of stock recruitment relationship with corals. Uh, so in the Kimberley region, we know that uh, both, both reproductive modes are common. Uh, what we are interested in finding out is uh, how much they contribute to the actual recruitment that we see. Normally, when we are doing this kind of work uh, for reproductive studies, we would uh, swim along, we would sample the corals, we would look for whether or not the eggs have developed, we would look for planula, we'd rank them in score, etc., etc. Uh, we also have uh, a fair bit of recruitment data for other reefs too, where we know that we can link uh, reproduction and recruitment. So in the Kimberley region, however, uh, it's obviously very logistically difficult. We can't do this diving. It's, it's even hard just if you're in water to stay on one spot. Um, so we have to come up uh, with some alternative methods. 
Uh, we chose the recruitment approach. Now, normally I wouldn't kind of endorse uh, recruitment tiles as a means of interpreting kind of reproductive patterns. But one exception here is that if you're doing it regularly, then you can kind of counter one of the main problems with just throwing, putting tiles out uh, occasionally. Uh, we, we trialed, uh, I think, three different versions of recruitment frames for this. They had to, they had to work. Uh, they have to stay in one spot. Uh, tiles can't, you can't have any movement of tiles or of the frame structures. Lava, we know, just don't like to settle on those kind of things. So we had to, we had to make sure we got it right, and we trialed a few different structures on different reefs around the place. Uh, after I came up with a few versions, Kylie came up with the one that actually worked, uh, which is <laughs> the version down here. Um, and that's what we used throughout. So the idea is that we put these things out regularly. Uh, we, we change the tiles over. The tiles need to weather for a period of time. In the top right-hand corner, there's a tile covered in algae, and there's one that's clean. Uh, they need to have this algal biofilm on them for lava to be attracted. Uh, so we did a changeover mechanism by which we uh, deploy tiles every month that we they, they stayed out for a duration of about two months. The lava settle on them. Uh, we can look at the skeleton of the lava, and then we can infer what types of corals were, were actually uh, settling, so whether or not they're brooders, spawners, a cropper of varieties, or these, or these different types. These are our locations. They, they overlap, uh, again, with uh, Marcial's work and the fish recruitment work, the ecological connectivity work, etc. So um, our design was really just focusing on five locations. We had replicate sites within and uh, replicate frames within tiles. Um, and we did these every month. Uh, so we changed over these uh, tile, tiles every month. So we can then get an idea of, uh, based on previous knowledge of when things are spawning and versus planulating. Uh, ideally, also, we were hoping to get a, a version of, uh, when you do this, you can also work out, uh, do you see stock recruitment relationships between how many corals in one spot versus how many larvae are settling, uh, whether or not certain places on the reef are sinks for larval recruitment, so do they actually get a lot more recruits than other places. Uh, and that's more uh, a reflection of um, spawning corals than brooding corals. Uh, so this, I might try, this is kind of a bit of a, So as this, we, we put out our tiles. We came up with a protocol for this too. We did some videos, we came up with that. This is pretty much the deployment. These are the kind of habitats you see. You'll see there is quite a lot of um, coral habitat in the Kimberley. It's um, it also a species that you wouldn't necessarily, I wouldn't have necessarily expected in such a turbid environment. Uh, these videos aren't sped up. This is kind of almost neat tides in the Kimberley, just floating over the coral reef. So um, you know, that's a challenging environment. Very patchy, uh, this is kind of what our tiles set up look like when they're nice and new, uh, easy to see. Not so easy to find when you've got to come back a month later and they're covered in algae, etc. That's a good day, this is a bad day. Uh, and it's about that point in time where we handled the job of deployment and finding them again to the Barney Chowley <laughs> Rangers, who did a, a really good job of it. Um, they obviously know the region very well, they know when to work the tires, they know, they know their sites. They can tell you that there's a boulder over there when it's um, three metres underwater and you can't see anything. But they, were, they were really exceptional, as I guess you would expect. Uh, I also have lost my curves. Look at this green. Yeah, yeah. And and this green. And go this way. Go the other way. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yeah, cool. Um, oh, now I need to get rid of this one. I'm sorry. All right, so, oh, now I need to add that we haven't analysed all this data. So uh, our last batch of tiles came back just a, a month or so ago from uh, the ranges. So we've only got up to a certain period of time. Uh, so these are the different kinds of corals, uh, the varieties of the big mass of corals that you get, the proper of the branching corals, isopora, brooding type corals. Uh, these are the ones that are common throughout the area. Uh, these are the, the data so far. Again, not all of them have been analysed up to here. Um, so we are actually seeing um, 
similar patterns of reproduction to what you see on the offshore reefs. You see that the, um, the uh, brooding corals producing plamula throughout. We've got a peak in November here, uh, mainly for the brooding corals, but um, you've seen also some uh, parietes spawning here. So that's in around the summertime. Okay. Then we come into uh, what is uh, essentially the time when we expect most of the spawning to be happening in Western Australia, which is March, April, and that's when we got these kind of temperature anomalies happening, uh, as I assume many of you are aware, uh, primarily in the southern Kimberley region, it would see, but I mean, you were still looking at somewhere between 10, 30, something percent mortality in the southern <coughs> area. Uh, and that was, that commenced in about February. Uh, we know that temperature affects not only kills corals, affects their reproductive output, that there's a lag effect there for a couple of years. Uh, and certainly there was some evidence uh, when you looked on some of the uh, tiles, even of the recruits that we uh, saw settling around the time of the spawning, that even those were kind of uh, clearly eroded and covered in algae, and, and there was evidence that even they had died uh, from this bleaching event. So no doubt that has um, biased our data quite quite significantly. Um, so in this plot I've got uh, the predicted spawning time. So predicted is based on uh, our experience from other parts of the reef. Uh, certainly you do see a signature of spawning here in the March, April when you would expect to have found it. Uh, when we look at the light blue and the dark blue, uh, bars there are the, uh, the, the primary spawning corals. Uh, but certainly these numbers are a lot lower than I would have anticipated. Uh, what's interesting, however, is we're still seeing the signature of things like uh, the fossil chloridae, some of the brood, uh, those brooders, uh, for several months after that. Uh, now, again, we haven't analysed all, all of these tiles yet. We need to see whether or not there's this, also this signature of spawning, bleaching or, or no bleaching, that we would have expected in um, spring. Uh, we were. We look at the spatial variation in recruitment here. So this, again, is um, something that we need to do uh, better when we've got more of the data and also considering the bleaching. But there's no, there's really no clear sourcing dynamics here. There's no real basis for the spawning uh, where you see a, a sink of recruitment. You do certainly see much higher uh, numbers for certain brooding corals. But again, you're less likely to, that's more likely a reflection of the fact that there are patches of brooding corals at certain sites. The larvae don't disperse that far and actually they recruit quite locally. Uh, that ties in very nicely with the work that uh, in the ecological connectivity work where uh, Jim Underwood's uh, report through Ramsey is, is published along with the other guys that work on the seagrass and the fish. And there's a very clear signal of uh, local recruitment in the uh, brooding corals there over like quite small scales. You know. Um, and again, even for the spawning corals, you see local recruitment over kilometres, less than tens of kilometres, most certainly, uh, which, is a, which is a pattern more, we're seeing more and more around the world. I mentioned that the numbers so far are very low, and certainly my experience uh, with a lot of this work to date has been at Scott Reef, which is the yellow, these are the oceanic reefs, and they're the, that's the ones highlighted in yellow. Uh, you see there, but they're actually much, much higher uh, values of recruitment than you see in other places, uh, other oceanic reefs, and certainly when I've spoken to Rich Evans or Damien Thompson or about their recruitment studies, you start, you see um, much lower numbers than you would at a place like Scott Reef. So again, we need to interpret um, this work better in the sense how much bleaching may have caused uh, some impact on the recruitment rate here versus why until now I've been somewhat biased in interpreting this in the sense of Scott Reef rates of recruitment. So, results so far, the, these are the tiles that we have, you know, the surveys we have completed November to June, and we've still got to finish off the June to November tiles. Um, what's interesting or good, despite, despite a few of the issues, including bleaching here, is that we are certainly seeing a signature of reproduction that is similar <coughs> to what we would have seen at the oceanic reefs and the, and the um, Pilbara reefs. So that's good. Um, Certainly also there's a really high um, signature of brooding corals contributing to recruitment on these reefs too, and that ties in well with the ecological connectivity work. Uh, parietes, uh, we know, spawns uh, in uh, summer in the Pilbara region. Uh, on the oceanic reefs it seems to spawn, not brood, but spawn over, uh, over several months through summer. And certainly in these tiles, uh, we probably need to go back and confirm our parietes IDs are correct, but there's certainly that 
more oceanic reef signature of spawning over several months mm -hmm. throughout the summer. Uh, there's evidence of mass spawning clearly in autumn, the main period, but um, probably affected by bleaching. Uh, spatial variation among locations, it's hard to know that we're going to be able to work with that up um, given the disturbances, etc. There's so much variation. Community assemblage, the current flow, the gene flow, all of those things are going to affect uh, those relationships. Uh, and as uh, Marcel pointed out, it's just well worth mentioning again or reiterating that last year was a very significant year, very unique year in, in the southern Kimberley region. So any kind of studies that have been going on there, physically or biological studies, they probably need to be interpreted in that context, um, for better or for worse. Uh, we have, uh, I think, developed a reasonably good method for the uh, deployment of tiles, and that can be used. Um, certainly it was used successfully by the rangers and others who have a protocol for that um, and they worked well in what is actually quite a hard environment. Lots of other people have put tiles out on frames to various with um, various success uh, in other parts but uh, there's certainly a lot of problems with doing that and hopefully we come up with a reasonable one. Uh, the Bardi Jerry Rangers were great with this. Um, it was really, uh, they, they did everything that we asked them to uh, and it's, it's such a valuable resource to have them on site. So, uh, for them to be able to go out and do these things monthly, obviously we couldn't get anything like that um, temporal variation, uh, temporal kind of replication. Uh, of course, they always work within their constraints. You, you know, if there's bushfires or there's mechanical difficulties or something, you know, they, they can um, prevent from getting out there. But give or take, they, they were really great. Um, and finally, uh, the approach seems to be uh, useful. We could, we could use it to build our knowledge on um, reproduction and recruitment in the area, to, to track the recovery from the bleaching, uh, and particularly one of the ways that this method is useful is it tells you about larval supply. So it tells you uh, if a place is or is not recovering, is it because the larvae aren't getting there, or is it not recovering because the larvae are getting there, but for example, or their habitat's been overgrown by algae. So they're two different processes, and this this method certainly gives you uh, an understanding of larval supply versus post recruitment mortality. And that's it. Thanks, James.